The Intel i7-3820 is one of the cheapest i7s you can pick up on eBay. It has four hyper-threaded cores based on Sandy Bridge, an architecture that most aging PC enthusiasts have fond memories of and can even be overclocked a little. And in 2022, here in the UK, you can pick one up for about £12. An i7 for that price? There must be something wrong with it, right? Well, as is so often the case, the answer is all about context. The X79 series was Intel's second attempt at an HEDT platform. After the first generation of i7 Xtremes for X58, Intel followed up with a platform based around their new, highly successful Sandy Bridge architecture. The big appeal of this extremely nerd-focused range was how overkill it was. X79 motherboards simply weren't high street compatible. They had enthusiast level features, high end power delivery, and big fragile sockets just begging to be damaged by an inexperienced hand. The CPU's design for that socket, the i7 3930K, 3960X, and top end 3970X, were all six core, 12 thread, multiplier unlocked beasts with oversized caches and quad channel memory support. Some of these specs wouldn't look out of place now, a decade later, and at the time, they were overkill for the majority of casual gamers. The i7-3820, released in 2012 as the cheapest of the four HEDT processors available on the platform, was... Well, to put it bluntly, it was an i7-2600 with pretensions. It still had the quad-channel memory of its socket mates, and a larger cache than its desktop counterpart, it supported twice as much RAM and had a couple hundred megahertz higher base clock, but it had the same four hyper-threaded cores, the same 3.8 gigahertz boost frequency, and was on the same architecture as the Socket 1155 chip. It wasn't even fully unlocked. If your BIOS allowed it, you could push the multiplier from 38 to 43, which, while not unwelcome, was still a long way from what was being offered on the other HEDT chips and even the more conventional desktop platforms. The i7-2600K, about $30 more expensive at launch but using dramatically cheaper Z68 motherboards, could hit 4.7 GHz or higher simply by increasing the multiplier and turning the voltage up a smidge. While the 3820 could be pushed to similar frequencies, it was only by adjusting the base clock, a somewhat less user-friendly method of overclocking CPUs. With the multiplier, it's limited to 4.3 GHz, a healthy 500 MHz boost over stock speeds, but come on, this is supposed to be a high-end desktop platform. Even if this is an entry-level chip, it shouldn't be lacking features compared to the consumer version. Intel learned this lesson with the second generation of chips for the socket, with the entry-level 4820K earning its extra letter by way of an unlocked multiplier, but that's a video for another day. In 2022, games are less single-thread dependent than in the Sandy Bridge Extreme days, and hyper-threaded quad-cores are beginning to show their weaknesses. An overclock can be a genuinely useful way of keeping these CPUs relevant in modern games, but I'm too lazy to muck around with the base clock, so I'm going to test the 3820 at 4.3 GHz in nine modern titles. The test system features a Gigabyte X79 UD3 motherboard, 16GB of quad-channel DDR3-2133, and a GeForce RTX 3070, which is the fastest GPU I own, to make sure that the CPU is being tested to its maximum. Back in my early days testing GPUs on the internet, I naively chose Valorant as a benchmark. After realising my error when an R9-290X scored the same as a 270X, I made a mental note to include it should I ever do CPU testing. Well, the day has arrived and the i7-3820 puts in a pretty respectable showing of 183 FPS on average. 1% lows were something of a letdown and 0.1s were possibly caused by a respawn or scene change, as I definitely don't recall any major noticeable stuttering in this title. I was testing at 1440 max settings, because RTX 3070, but as you can see from the afterburner overlay, it's not exactly working hard. I haven't built up a catalogue of benchmarks to refer to as yet, but I have got a fair number of results from different CPUs in Valorant. For context then, the undervolted 4.6GHz Ryzen 5 5600X I use for editing scored 
418 FPS at the same settings with the same GPU. The Ryzen 5 3600 scored about 195 FPS with a GTX 1060 3GB, the Ryzen 3 3100 scored between 175 and 185 FPS with a whole slew of different GPUs, and a first gen Ryzen 1500X only managed about 135 FPS with a GTX 1650. As a gamer, the Battlefield series aren't really my thing, but thanks to large maps, destructible buildings and high player counts, they do put more demand on a CPU than your average military-themed FPS. Battlefield 5 is not the newest game in the series, but the advantage of picking the older and more popular game is that it's very much not testing the RTX 3070, even at 1440 high, so all the weight is on the CPU, and it's not holding up that well, to be honest. Average frames are around 100, which is fine, and point one's a single digit, but again, that could be deaths or transitions or something, but there's just this permanent lack of smoothness, a constant stutter throughout that I always think might go away with a bit of time, but that never quite does. I'm sure a Fortnite Pro could tell you which renderer is the current meta, but as I wanted to put the maximum possible stress on the CPU, I've opted for performance mode. The GPU isn't reaching 50% usage most of the time, even at 1440 with DLSS quality and settings as high as they'll go. Average FPS is 185, and while frame times in Fortnite are a known issue, and 1% and 0.1% lows are generally pretty terrible on any system, some will be worse than others. The 3820 can provide reasonably okay 1% lows, but the 0.1% scores hit the middle teens. Again, I don't have a huge pool of results to refer to here, as in GPU tests I'm usually running in DX12 mode, but modern mid-range Ryzen's like my 5600X should score about double this. Overwatch 2 is kind of a counterpoint to the other free-to-play shooters in this test, as it doesn't seem too phased by CPU performance. Averages at 1440 max settings are stepping into high refresh territory, and given that the game isn't quite maxing out the CPU, dropping settings or resolution will see a couple more frames on top of that. The low 0.1% frame rates seem to come from kill cams, and I'm new to the game, so I'm dying a lot. Using the render scaling set to 66%, it gives about 20% higher averages, breaking past the 165Hz mark for anyone in possession of a fancier monitor, and quality isn't too badly affected. The Ryzen 5600X only scores about 20 FPS higher on average at 1440, so I think it's fair to say this CPU is a reasonable choice for Overwatch. Uh, I, I mean Overwatch 2. <laughs> of course. Silly me. I only recently purchased Spider-Man Remastered and haven't quite got over the urge to just use it as a New York tourism simulator yet. It's a big budget AAA PlayStation port, so you'd expect a fairly lightweight game, at least for the CPU, but this is a port of the remaster, which features ray tracing. With RT enabled, the CPU is seeing a great deal of utilisation. While I'm still playing at 1440 very high settings, with DLSS quality enabled, the game actually isn't GPU limited and the game runs at a pretty playable 40 FPS average with cinematic lows. For comparison, my editing rig scores 73 FPS with 48 1% lows. Of course, you might well wonder how the 3820 performs without RT. Well, while it's not a night and day improvement, the conventional render option still gains a healthy 20% boost to averages, coming close to 50 FPS, but lows unfortunately have not improved at all. Likewise, just about everything presents issues in Cyberpunk, not just the ray tracing. Without RT, I'm at 1440 Ultra with DLSS quality, and the i7 can just about hit an average of 50 FPS. 1% and 0.1% lows aren't great, coming in either side of 30 FPS, but there's the option to reduce crowd and traffic density to take a little bit of load off the CPU if you want to. With RT on, there's not a whole lot to be done. I tried all of the RT quality presets, and at 1440 DLSS balanced, they all scored about the same, hovering around 40 FPS, with 24 FPS 1% and 0.1s in the low 20s. For that reason, I settled on the Ultra preset going forwards, because low quality RT is a ridiculous idea, anyway. <music> 
After having finally found my way back to Saint Denis, I found the best test of Red Dead Redemption is just to take a quiet canter around the city. I'm still at 1440 with quality DLSS, meaning for a render resolution of about 1707 by 960 and I pushed the quality preset all the way to the right but left advanced settings locked and that meant for an average FPS of 55, 1% lows of 36 and 0.1s of 25. The city is a moderately heavy stress test on the i7, wandering around the smaller town of Valentine scored a few frames higher and the open wilderness is by and large much less intensive, so on the whole I think you'll find this is a very playable experience. Elden Ring isn't really made with benchmarking in mind. It caps at 60 FPS, and while it can be modded to remove the cap, the mod requires disabling online play, and that means nobody's gonna come help you kill bosses or sneak up and kick your ass either, so I guess it swings and roundabouts. Anyway, I tend to assume people don't want to mod their games to play them, so I mostly just test them out of the box. At 1440 max, the RTX 3070 is more than up to the task of rendering the game at a steady 60fps, especially when paired with a modern CPU. In the 3820's case, we're a way short of that. Averages are only 46, 1%'s dropped to 30, and 0.1's are only in the single digits. Finally, after some feedback from my audience, I was recommended to test out a 4x strategy game. Now, I haven't played a Civ game since the late 90s, and that one came on floppy disks, so I wasn't about to go and play Civ 6 all the way to the end game to get an authentic in-game benchmark, so I used the canned AI test. Sorry. That saw an average turn time of 7.57 seconds, which, I don't know, that seems fine to me. My only point of reference is the Ryzen 5 5600X, which managed a 6.67 second average. I guess that 0.9 second difference adds up over a really large number of turns, and I hope it means something to someone, but for me I think it's just a number to judge them by. On the subject of numbers that probably mean something to someone, but which I suspect most people just use as a yardstick, here's some synthetic productivity and gaming benchmarks. So just why is this one of the cheapest i7s? Well, in the context of the x79 platform, this was always a CPU that sold purely on price. If you can find a good working motherboard for this socket in 2022, it's going to set you back at least £100. For a total of £112, you could pick up a similar performing Z68 or Z77 and a used 2600K and probably still have cash left over. You could even stretch to something more recent, perhaps an early Ryzen, for similar money, and gain a much healthier upgrade path in the process. With that in mind, I can't wholeheartedly recommend the i7-3820 in 2022. That's not a reflection on its performance. Sure, there were moments when things got a little dicey, but very few games were genuinely unplayable in a way that couldn't have been overcome. It just doesn't represent good value, even at an astonishingly low price. If you already have, or can get a great deal on, an X79 motherboard and want a great value CPU to go with it, there are plenty of far better options available. The other i7s on the platform, with more cores and cache than any mainstream CPU would have for several more years, can also be had for very cheap. I'll be looking at a few of them over the coming weeks, and I think some of them are going to surprise you. Keep an eye out for those videos, and check out this one to see how the 3820 did in games when it was released back in 2012. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.